Hello, this is Greg Allison from Green Greggs. we got a special guest tonight, John Hollerman. Tonight we're going to be talking about the situation in the world, how tense it is, the, why you really need to prepare, because we are in a dire strait. The tensions are going up. And my friend, my guest, John Hollerman, he is now with his new position, the deputy director of the U.S. Task Force on National and Homeland Security, the organization founded by none less than the late Dr. Peter Vincent Pry. I am the Alabama State Director. And furthermore, uh, uh, Jonathan started out as a uh, military uh, trainer. He was trained in the area of what we call SEER, which is survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. So he is a top-notch prepper. He's written a book that's coming out, and he is the uh, president of his own company, Grid Down Consultant. He is also uh, on the uh, board of directors of the Impact America, this EMP Act America, uh, which also has uh, General Ken Krosniak, who's been on my channel many times. And John's been on my channel a couple times already, too. So uh, we're going to talk about this threat, and we're going to talk about things that you can do. And we'll, we're going to plug a few other things along the way, like Grid Down Power Up, uh, a documentary that's come out that our, our organizations have been quite involved in, and a couple of other things. So, John, tell us what you're most concerned about at this moment with everything going on in the world. My most my my biggest concern right now with what's going on, uh, I am really watching what's happening in Russia, not Ukraine, but Russia. We know what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, we get news reports. We're kept up to speed with what's happening in Ukraine. I'm less concerned about what's you know the warfare that's happening in there than what may start happening in, in Russia. We were seeing a lot of these advanced weapons start uh, being sent to Ukraine, Patriot missiles and other longer range missiles and then things that they have. Uh, if they start using some of this equipment inside Russia, if they start using cyber attacks against Russia's electric grid or, or blowing up, you know, military bases inside Moscow, especially using American or German or NATO weapons, uh, there's probably going to be some serious ramifications from that. Could you know? I don't think they're going to hit the nuke button the next day, but it could escalate very quickly. They could hit the the American mainland with some cyber attacks. It it could go tit for tat and grow pretty quick. So that's my biggest concern right now. Well, my biggest concern is we're playing Russian roulette right now. We're poking the bear and we're pushing it. We don't know where the real red lines are. They've told us those red lines, and we're in a, prog a process of crossing those. Uh, pretty dang quick uh, one after another this uh these uh, uh tanks that we're sending over now the m1 a, a2 tank we're sending our best tank it just don't have the most reactive high uh armor technology on it we're sending but it does have the uh, uh commander scopes and the things that, that some of our top end technology in the avionics electronics into the spectrum uh, and the uh, germans are sending in they're a leopard tank. They're sending in the, uh, I believe it's the A6, which is the next, the latest version on that. So that's not their, the older, older stuff. We're, we're sending some really good stuff. Not only that, we're depleting our ammo levels uh, right now. So we're putting ourselves at risk. Should we have to engage in another uh, war or protracted war with anyone to include China, which uh, might be around the corner? What do you make of all this? Yeah, I... So China has been a little surprised. I actually thought they would have maybe acted uh, before this. I think China is really watching the world's reaction to Russia. To, you know, we're poking, we're poking the bear. The bear's poking up. They're poking back. Uh, hopefully, he doesn't decide to bite back. But uh, I think uh, the president over in China right now, he's got his hands full with apparently COVID in his country and a bunch of other things that are his economy is not doing so great. But with that said, at some point, I, I do anticipate him going after Taiwan before Biden's out of office, especially with how bad things kind of look politically for Biden right now. If Biden doesn't get really elected and you get a, uh, a Trump or DeSantis or, you know, somebody uh, more strong in there, it, you know, I, I think they're going to be less likely to go after Taiwan in that scenario. So Biden's proven to be kind of a uh, a limp noodle in a suit in most most of the time uh, in foreign policy. I mean, I've been surprised a couple things that he's done, but, you know, I'm kind of surprised he's sending tanks. It seems like when we need him to be strong, he does something weak. And then when we need him to, you know, be cautious and not start World War III, he starts sending missiles and tanks to to, to Ukraine. So I, I don't know. Uh, 
this this might play in China's favor. I mean, if they could just sit back and watch us deplete our ammo, then we got less to take them on. So they may be, they may be. This might be the best deal in the world for China and their ambitions. Just oh, let them play out, let them uh, spend their stuff and weaken themselves down, and and then and then we've got our best position ever. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think China's just they're just watching there. They're they're tapping their thumbs, just just counting the clock, watching what's happening in Ukraine, watching how NATO gets involved. Um, I mean, but here's the thing: we we took we kicked Russia out of SWIFT, right? That was the big move, and I don't I don't know that it was the right move because it had some pretty big ramifications global oh, yeah. economy wise. But you know you know darn well we ain't kicking China out of SWIFT. That 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 no. that won't happen because like they make like everything is comes from China, right? I mean that would destroy the global economy if we kick China out of SWIFT. So I think they know. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's hard to get in the mind of some of these guys. I've been wrong about some of the things Putin's done in the past year or two i've been kind of shocked on some of the things that have come out um i kind of expect him to react different earlier uh one person everybody if 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 you're listening to this you should check out is tom popic over at the foundation for resilient societies he's got some really good reports on the ukrainian power grid and why russia did not take down their power grid on day uh on day one and it's really fascinating stuff and he tracks their, you know, the things that are happening with their electric power grid pretty closely. And he's, you know, he's a smart guy, Tom. And, you know, he's got, he, he puts a lot of information there on his website. Yeah. I've been meaning to get him on my channel too. And we had kind of made a preliminary contact. We just kind of missed each other in the dark. <laughs> I got to get back chasing him because he would be, he's, he's one of the early guys talking about the problems with the spent fuel rod pulls at the nuclear power plants. And when I started talking, I didn't know there's anybody out there else already talking it. And I found that he was. So uh, I thought I actually started that conversation. And then I saw that he had been talking to the actual, uh, pr- previous to me. So I'm, I'm happy to know that uh, you know he's definitely been pushing that. He's a really smart guy. And uh, so I definitely want him on this channel. So it, maybe you can just put a bug in his ear. I, I definitely got to contact him again. So, For sure. So, uh, John, what do you assess as being the level of threat involved here? Do you have some idea for just how tense it is would you say if we were playing russian roulette how many uh how many chambers do we have and how many rounds do we have in our uh, in the chambers if it's if we're looking at a 30 percent uh risk of going to nuclear war that would mean two rounds and a six banger i don't know what <laughs> of course maybe it's just hard to assess anything but is that something you'd like to venture toward Sure. I mean, I, I know I'm probably in the, the very, very low minority of um, analysts that would say this, but uh, I don't believe that I, I don't I don't believe there's a high risk all out nuclear war um, situation brewing at this point in time. I, I, I don't I don't think with and the reason I say that the caveat I'm using is because of super EMP weapons that these countries have developed there there's no reason for them to fire 80 or 100 icbms across the ocean and we see them coming and we fire ours and that you know everybody's a glass parking lot when they can send a a submarine into the gulf of mexico or put a a, a single nuclear weapon in a k club launcher on a cargo ship coming out of you know egypt into the gulf of mexico there's there's many ways to set off an emp and we've seen yeah. in their war doctrine all of our enemy countries EMP is the first strike attack because if they hit us and they take down every aspect of human life in this country, including our military, they don't have to fight a war, right? A nuclear war is World War Three, right? You can win World War Three in hour one with an EMP and, and everybody knows it, right? So that is the ultimate weapon at this point. So I, I, I fear that more than I do, you know, a lot of the pundits in the mainstream media, they, they really, because it's fear porn, you know, in the media, you know, the nuclear war. And and, I, and let, let, let's be honest, let's be honest. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of Russian oligarchs, you know, the, the mouthpieces for Putin that we're seeing in the media coming out saying stuff. But uh, Selnoyan, which is uh, this this woman that's real close to, yeah. to Putin, and I, I've been following her for years. Uh she, I mean, she's the one that warned here uh, a year and a half ago, right before this thing kicked off, that, you know, her anticipation was that Russia was going to invade Ukraine, U.S. was going to get involved, 
and then Russia was going to take down the uh, the Florida electric grid and New York City electric grid, and then we were going to hit take down Moscow's electric grid, and then they were going to hit us with an EMP. That that and she said, you know, that is a war we're prepared to fight, and we will win that that war of you know you infrastructures. So, and then she just came out here last week making some big threats again. So again, I I, I want to couch this with, I mean, it makes good headlines. These are. You know, if Putin came out and said that, it would be like pucker factor at that point, right? But, I mean, he's sending his 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 mouthpieces out there. You know, this isn't by accident. There's a lot of these generals and stuff saying that so he can have, like, three degrees separation. Our president and our, our politicians do the same thing, right? Yeah. So um, – I'd like to add, she, she is the uh, the uh, director of RT, which is, I guess, Russia Today, the, ma the major mouthpiece yep. of Russia. And anything that comes out of there is official. They don't – they're not allowed just to run like our news media here and just whatever they want to write and put out. No, it goes through the state. It goes, it's clear by Putin for it said, and she's really tight with Vladimir Putin, as you mentioned. Yes. And I mentioned her a few times on this channel too. So, because she is one to watch and keep an eye on you're exactly right watching her. So uh, that, that is a very important point. And, but, you know, really and truly an EMP attack ultimately is as bad as a nuclear attack because uh, in a, in a, EMP attack the cities, and they may not die instantly, but that might be a mercy killing. They're going to starve over time. The death level uh, from an EMP attack could be worse than just if it were just a pure nuclear attack without EMP effects, which might be hard to achieve. But 100%. Hand in hand. No, you're right. You're right. You're, I, you're absolutely right. An EMP attack, I believe, would be far deadlier because typically – with uh, nuclear war, you're going to send tactical nukes and you're going to hit military targets at first. Maybe a couple, you know, major cities, New York, Atlanta, Dallas, you know, L.A., Seattle, some of these military bases. But um, in your first round of volleys, but in, in an EMP attack, you you take out every life sustaining infrastructure our entire country has. And it, it, so Iran considers this Sharia compliant. In Iran's war doctrine, they consider EMP a Sharia compliant first strike because they don't they, they don't technically kill anybody when they set that nuclear weapon off at 300 kilometers above the the Earth's surface over Kansas or Oklahoma. Nobody dies. I mean, maybe some people that are on some planes, but nobody dies right off the bat. Uh, and they they say that basically. It's our own arrogance and our reliance on electricity that kills us. So they don't actually kill us. We kill ourselves, which is what's going to happen. Well, it may but, uh, also, well, yeah, it may also be our lack of taking the action to get our power grid hard, like you and I and several other people have been clamoring for for years. We've been clamoring for amen. Ages. I mean, think back. What was it? Fourteen years ago now, or something like that. That the, uh, the MP task force got the uh, the congressional MP task force, which uh, Dr. Pry was on, got the report. Uh, the, the, the analysis said that in within a year, nine out of 10 people in our nation would be dead from societal collapse after an EMP attack of that size. You know, if you take down the nation and like you put one over Omaha, Kansas, like you said, the nation just dies out. But uh, I had talked with Pry about that. And I said, uh, look, you know, they didn't take into account the uh, spent fuel rod poles and nuclear plants. They might have counted the nuclear plants, but they weren't counting that. I don't think they even counted for that. So, and everybody wants to pay attention to the reactors because that's where all the focus is. But even the spent fuel rod pools are a very serious matter. And that's why I talk about those because they're usually ignored. And, you know, these things can be given off radiation for decades. Uh, and, and it's not a pretty picture at all. So there's a lot more than just the effects of losing power. And, and a lot of my prepper friends, they think, well, I'm, hey, I live off grid. I'll be fine. But when them, the, the, the cities are suddenly starving, it's going to be like kicking a, a fire ant nest or hitting a, a hornet nest with a baseball bat. They're not going to come out and they're going to be hunting somebody to eat. <laughs> that, well, that's exactly right. I, I would say that the people in the country are every bit as dependent on the civilian infrastructure as the city people. So uh, just just to, to challenge those listening, like uh, I live <laughs> – I live in West Virginia. There's probably 12 houses within uh, two square miles of me and six of them are farms. Okay. So nice, nice. like I live very remote and the, the small town next to me, I think it's eight or 900 people. I mean, that town is every bit reliant on the, those trucks rolling into the grocery store. I mean, if, if yeah. you stop interstate trucking in a small town like that, uh, it's going to be every bit as devastating as downtown New York city. Yes. They may not riot and loot as 
quickly. Uh, but I say you probably got a couple extra days uh, before things kind of go south because, I mean, the people that live in these small towns, they're just as dependent on the government and grocery stores as as the uh, the bulk of the American people. So it's kind of a misnomer. I mean, I realize they may even have some more life skills than the, quote, city folk, right? But um, they – there's a difference between having more life skills and understanding how to grow your own food, how to root sell your own food, know how exactly how much food you need to store up for an entire winter. You know what I mean? There's a lot more to it than just growing a garden in your backyard. Hey, and talking about storing food, I'm going to do a quick little shameless plug. We got a print with Greg.com. We got a special right now. We get over $200 off a of three month supply of this food. It gives actually. 2,000 calories a day plus, and there's also some other prepping uh, deals they've thrown in with this deal. You can get other prepping supplies with it, prepwithgreg.com, special on the three-month supply with other prepping supplies that come in with it. It's an excellent thing because uh, how many of the other guys offer 2,000 calories a day? Uh, none that I know of. Uh, most of them offer about 800. And it's funny, so on that subject, so hey, here, here's a good point. Have you ever read the Minnesota Starvation Experiment? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what they okay, were so, 800 calories a day, and they were starving. Actually, believe it or not, they were starving to death, and they, 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 got, they got pitiful. Yeah, the, the six, they were given 1,500 calories a day, and they were still starving to death. So that, that was half – so they their normal rations were 3,200. They were put on half rations at, at 1,500. And, uh, yeah, after six months, they looked like, you know, they stepped out of a Holocaust movie. It was pretty, pretty breathtaking. So – and most of the long-term food plans, and I tell clients all the time, that they're like, oh, yeah, I've got two years' worth of food. You know, I said, where are you buy it? And they'll get, give me the name, this big name. And I said, well, you've actually probably got about four months' worth of calories. You know, a serving size, a quarter cup of rice a day is not going to keep you – going to keep no. the body fed. So, No, no, that's true. So, that, yeah, prepwithgreg.com. Y'all go there and check that out. So, so you, you got a book coming out. What's your book? So yeah, I got a. Let me reach over here. So it is. Trying to add it closer within reach, but it's survival theory two. Okay, so this is a follow up to my number one best selling survival theory. Okay, now survival theory two is the is kind of the culmination of my life's research and work. Uh, so I back in two thousand. 19 was the last electromagnetic defense task force uh, that I was at when that was over. General Quas uh, and the leadership there asked me to write a, a white paper for the military on starvation uh, because that's kind of my background. I had some, uh, some, some research in that, and we had discussed it, and I had shown concerns about the military and food. So I, I spent about six months or eight months uh, fine crafting a lot of my research. We talked about the Minnesota starvation experiment. Uh, doc, uh, you can look at Philip Zimbardo, uh, world renowned psychologist, 1970s Stanford prison experiment. He wrote a book called Lucifer Effect How Good People Turn Evil or How, how Good People Do Evil. Uh, and he his his research is like, you know, a German Nazi who could work on a Holocaust camp. And then two years later, they find him, you know, he's a, he's a dad. He works a nine to five. You know, and so like how people, when you take away law and order, can step outside and put them in extreme situations, how they can step outside of their normal routines and do things that people would never suspect that they were capable of doing. So that's a fascinating book. So uh, the survival theory too. the subtitle is, is the psychology and physiology of starvation, human desperation and living without rule of law in a prolonged grid down event. So that is the the nature of the the first probably forty percent of my this survival theory two is my report that I wrote for the military explaining how the psychological effects uh, that are going to uh, mass uh, starvation psychosis that's going to affect the human beings because a lot of kind of preppers have this I'm going to barter my way through survival type thing and they don't understand that the people that they're going to be um, dealing with are not going to be in their right mind. Right. And, and, you know, they're not going to you're, you're you're taking a big risk. Every, every human interaction you have for the first year after a good down event is a, is a risk because they're sizing you up. You know, if you're oh, the yeah, only yeah. one on your block. Yeah. But you trade with them and they know what they gave you to get what they got. And they know you got what they gave you and they're going to want it back. And so they're, yeah. they're going to know what else you got. And they're, they're figuring out a way to get at you, probably. 
Yeah, they're, they're going to be counting your belt notches. There's the uh, is this is, this is the uh, is this guy skinny? Is he gray like it and gaunt like everybody else? They're going to be sizing up everything because that's what you do when you're starving. Your senses get acute. You get tunnel vision. You start the only thought in your brain is is, is food. So yeah, you might have traded him. He might have gave you a chicken and you gave him you know some some supplies or something like that. Some uh, you know a bag of rice. That might have been his last chicken, his group's last chicken, right? And they were trading that chicken to see what you had, what they could get from you. And they're coming back tonight, right? So these are the things uh, like that kind of mentality is like it's outside of people's what's called normalcy bias. So, you know, human normalcy bias is basically you go to work, you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you get in your car, you drive to work, you have conversations with people. Nobody's trying to kill you or size you up for your food, right? Uh, things make sense. The decisions you make have consequences. Uh, if something happens, there's law and order. You call 911, the police show up and they help you. Uh, in this type of world scenario, that this whole system of life that you've been accustomed to since the day you were born disappears that fast. And there's a whole new world order. It's called survival of the fittest, right? And that world order where there's no oversight, there's no judges, there's no police, there's no government, there's no military. It's every man for himself. That world is going to be so foreign to a lot of people, they're not going to be able to react or make proper decisions. They're still going to try and live and, and, and have conversations and interact with humans the same way they are doing now, not realizing that humanity has jumped into a time machine it's way more dangerous than it was you know two weeks before when the when the event happened yeah well our our, our uh, veneer of civility is a bit thin and once you get into the realm of starvation it vanishes so uh, and that's something that philosophers have written about for some time that's not something that's just been discovered although we always forget it as it seems because we take it for, you know, our normalcy bias, we take things for granted that everything's going to continue as it has, unfortunately. Right. So uh, what do you recommend, given the threat posture we're in today, what do you recommend people do for themselves? Well, that, it's difficult. So so let's let's first start by saying that we are taught an EMP or a sol massive solar flare like a character event. These, this is worst case scenario. This is America's Achilles heel. This is the worst possible thing that could happen to this country. Uh, we could have a, a, a really deadly pandemic, not like the last one, but I mean, a, a one where 20% of people are dropping dead. Uh, we could have a real serious financial collapse. Uh, there, there's a massive cyber attack. We're watching what's happening with artificial intelligence. Quantum computing is just around the corner. You, you tie the chat GPT to a quantum computer and you know, accelerates the things that that thing can do. I mean, we're talking about, in fact, the guy that the guy that uh, either invented or runs Chappie GT, I don't know his name off the top of my head, just two days ago, there's a story. He came out and said, we're, you know, AI, open AI. It was open AI. Who, right. He said, man, he's like, this is like amazing. We're going to do great things. He goes, but I'm also very concerned that it could be lights out with chat you know with this open ai he actually used the, that terminology wow. so th there's you know physical attacks against the grid we're watching what's happening in more north carolina and uh, oregon and washington the recent attacks on the substations in these states there's a lot of things ramping up there's a lot of unanswered questions and what people must know is our grid is not hardened if they take out our high voltage transformers those things take 12 to 18 months to build uh, they come from South Korea and Germany and more recently from China, which is crazy. That's a subject we can get into here in a minute. But um, And so the first high-voltage transformers to get the grid back up and running, they're not hitting the shores for 12 to 18 months. 90% of your population is gone by the time the first one shows up. So, I mean, where are you going to find a lineman or, or a, you know, a, a crew to, to, to deliver that thing where it needs to go? Eight and, out of ten people are dead, and, and given that we can't find them today anyway, so yeah, you're going to be up the creek. But they, you know, the production rate of those are based on a production rate for supplying uh, right seats that exist today. I mean, copper's copper's actually really back ordered right now. Yeah, I mean, this is the I'm here yeah. now. It may take three years to get one of these things, but these this is the ideal situation. If if you have 
uh, bank accounts and uh, uh, electronics that are working so you can put in the requisition, the order, and if all the, the, the infrastructure is working so they can manufacture it, then they can ship it to you. And then you got to have everything on your side working where you can install it. I mean, if yeah. you get hit by MPs or CME from the sun, they'll see the sun could hit, take out the world or, or vast yep. swaths of the world. So you yep. know they can operate on their side. And if they can, how do you contact them? And then if all everything was in perfect work in order, which won't be in this situation, uh, if suddenly you've lost uh, you know thousands of your transformers, it would, could take ten or fifteen years once you start getting them on your loading dock to to replace them uh, if they could manufacture them. So there's just there's a lot of but by then what's left of the country? I mean you lost everybody in the first year. Yeah, who you, who you fixing it for, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I. This is the Humpty Dumpty to me, uh, John. I mean, I don't know, and I don't see, and I'd like somebody to explain to me how we get back to where we're at within 100 years. I don't see it happen. I think it's going to crash, and it's going to take a long time to put all these pieces back together again and build something that works, and it'll be a different society then. I don't know how we get back to some level of operations, even if we do. I don't know that we do. I mean, the, the EMP Commission, warned, it, it's a continental time machine. It, it, it literally, it, it's an end of civilization event. And that is the thing that's so frustrating. I, last Thursday, I was down in uh, uh, Texas on a panel at the Texas State Capitol alongside uh, Senator Bob Hall down there uh, trying to get the Texas grid hard. And there's, there's a handful of politicians. But, you know, I, I've sat in enough meetings now with enough high level people to realize that. Um, you know, it's easy to say, oh, we need to harden the grid, but it's actually an exceptionally complicated problem that's happening right now. OK, so you have different approaches to get the grid hard. One is the carrot approach. Let's entice the electric utilities. Hey, you can raise some interest. You can raise some of your your rates, make some more money, you know, to pay for this. This, you know, like the carrot, dangle the carrot in front of them saying, hey, go along and, and harden your grid uh, and do the right thing because you're not doing it now. Well, that's just not going to happen. Uh, it, after the uh, what was the what was the Sandy the the big power outage on the East Coast? I think it was Sandy. It was well, one of the big power outages took down like two states, and it was caused by a tree limb falling on a power line. And oh, so that was the whole got, Northeast, John. It wasn't just the states. That, that was yeah, the whole Northeast, Ohio, right? New York and parts of Ontario, and <laughs> yeah. Back well, the. the so FERC stepped in and they told the, the industry, they said, hey, you need to come up with a comprehensive uh, tree trimming plan to prevent this stuff from happening. It took them eight years to develop a tree trimming plan. So this idea that we're going to, you know, that we're going to turn it over to the utilities and they're going to come up with a plan. They're, they're current. I mean, we're seeing with their substations, their critical infrastructure protection standards for their substations and their, their gates. And it's it's they write their own standards. There's no federal oversight. Whenever somebody breaks one of their critical infrastructure uh, protection standards, they, they're required to turn themselves in to their own industry. Their own industry writes the fine. They pay the fine back to their own industry coffers, their lobbying coffers at NERC, right? And right. now, through freedom of information, we're not even allowed to know who's breaking the security standards. Everybody needs to go and follow Michael Maybe. Uh, uh, grid security now he he covers this stuff through and through it is atrocious what we're letting the electric utilities run roughshod over the american people they're not fixing stuff we can't force them to do it so that's the other side is, you know we have the carrot approach and then the other side is like well the government's going to pay for everything and they're going to force them to, to to harden the grid and we'll pay for it and they've been fighting that with tooth and nail for 20 years that's been the approach the emp commission and, and you know a lot of the national leaders have taken the top-down approach to the federal level the problem is is electric utilities they don't want federal oversight they're the one they can do whatever they want if something bad happens like in texas we had i think what 240 something people died in the texas uh blackout after the ice storms if there were federal regulations on, you know, stuff that, that they were cheating, we know they were cheating behind the scenes, and that's why it happened. There was an ice storm in 81 that took the power grid down. But if there was federal oversight forcing them to do this and they broke it, now they're liable. Those 240 people can sue the utility, right, And, and, and be, because of that, because they're breaking federal law. Right now, they can do whatever they want. They can hide what's happening. They can lie to the American people. 
and they want the status quo. And that's what Mike Maybe's found. But what really frosts yep. my boat is what Mike Maybe found. And if those that don't know, I've had Command Sergeant Major Mike Maybe on my channel, sir. Yes. Now, what Mike Maybe found that really frosts my boat is that he found that they've actually spent more money lobbying against hardening the grid than they would have needed to harden the grid. So just, just harden the grid. Yep. So those expensive yep. case straight lawyers in, in Washington, D.C., uh, they're, they're making a killing over there, uh, just lobbying uh, with the money that could have been used to do something useful to get their grid and harden, and then they wouldn't have to be no worry about this, no further discussion. But now they'd rather give it to those daggum lawyers on K Street in Washington, D.C., and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. They spent uh, – so the, the electric utility lobby is the second hot, biggest lobbyist in, in Washington, D.C., Behind pharmaceuticals, they spend more money than big oil in D.C., lobbying congressmen and senators to prevent more regulation. Again, they are the last industry in this country. There's no federal oversight. Uh, so you have NERC, the uh, North American Energy Reliability um, Corporation. Cor uh, Corporation, and then you have, uh, so that's like their electric utility oversight lobbyists. And then you have FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, right. which oversees NERC, but FERC makes recommendations to NERC all the time and they they just don't follow through with it they just NERC's don't, not they, even they don't permitted to nurk's not even re permitted to write a regulation they have to take it i mean FERC is not they have to take it from nurk so they got yeah. the industry has to propose the regulation and they just rubber stamp it at the federal level it's a very and, and they had a big revolving door between them so it's a very incestuous relationship to yeah. everybody, except yeah. the industry itself no you're absolutely right because uh, it was like two years ago like the four FERC commissioners we're on C-SPAN. I was like listening to their talk, you know, and then when I, I started, like one of them was pretty solid. He was making some good points. And I, so I started Googling these guys and their background. The other three came from NERP. Like they're, it's like, like you said, it's a revolving door. Like the electric utility lawyers, they end up in the federal government. They're all through DHS today. They're all through the Department of Energy today. So here's my other issue. You know, we're sitting, we're sitting in these groups, we're strategizing, we're trying to figure out how to get legislation through. Uh, the problem is, is if you force the federal government right now on the books, the science that that the federal government at DHS and at uh, DOA, they're holding up EPRI's science. Uh, uh, the, what is it? Uh, Edison Policy Research, uh, Electric Policy Research Institute. So basically the science behind uh, hardening a grid against a GMD or solar flare or EMP, uh, they say you only need to harden to 8 kVm, which is insane. Military standards is 85, okay? So what they're, they're recommending, so an EPRI, this EPRI science report. Well, super weapons are 200. Right, exactly. So the, the EPRI is industry funded. So it's like, it would be like uh, Marlboro back in the 50s, putting some doctors together and saying, hey, cigarettes are good for your health. You know, you're literally listening to the science from the, the industry who doesn't want to harden, right? And who's refusing to harden. So the problem is if we force the legislation through and put money behind it, they're only going to harden to that standard. We're kind of screwed anyway. So it's it's frustrating. And I know this sounds, what we need to do is we need to spread the word because the top-down approach legislation has not been working for 23 years, okay? We need to get the American people groundswell. We need to get them motivated. We need to get them marching on Washington saying, hey, it's our wives and kids, and we need to get them. And a good way to do that is our friend David Tice's documentary, Grid Down, Power Up. So if you want to plug that, it's griddownpowerup.com. Uh, you could go there. You can watch the documentary for free. You can share it with friends and family. It uh, Dennis Quaid, uh, the actor Dennis Quaid is the one that narrates it. It explains it uh, in, in really easy to understand language uh, for everyone to like understand what the threat is. And then on the back side, of it, he has a take action page where you can uh, get involved. You you can find out who your local representatives are. You can find uh, find we, the, there's papers there on you know what to send them. Uh, to, to try and get involved and, and force your politician to, to to vote for this and to fix this. Amen. And I've had him on my channel two times, uh, David Tice. And, oh, you have, David? Yeah, yeah, I've had him on there twice. I've also had David Womack on a couple of times. He's got another mm -hmm. uh, similar documentary. Uh, but the, the one right now with uh, Tice has just had its premiere. 
And uh, he's definitely developing a, a good network capability for people to take action. And getting Dennis Quaid was a coup for one because he's, you know, he's nationally recognized and explains things well, as you said. So these are all good things for our movement. I've also set up a website called uh, freedomrestorationfoundation.org. It's a little broader in scope than just the grid, but it's got the same tools in there. You can go in there to the Action Center page, and it tells you, once you scroll down past all our action alerts, it tells you uh, how to find your state legislators, state legislation, federal legislation, state your federal uh, representatives in the, in the co Congress, the House of Representatives, and your senators, and how to contact them, make phone calls, uh, how to email them, so we go through all that in there. It is, and, 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 and then at the bottom, it's got all those links recapitulated. So, and I pay for that out of my own pocket. So, you know, we're, we're out here putting stuff out, trying to get people to take action. And that, that stuff can work. I've had personal experience with that. So we just need to wake people up to these facts. Um, yeah. So, so there's, so I like to be proactive. I mean, you know, I'm, you know, I'm in the prepping community. You're in the prepping community, but we're in a little different set of, we're in the preventative community. Because we've been trying to stop this nonsense from happening in the first place by getting our grid hardened. If we had a grid hardened, most of the things that we worry about, we wouldn't have to worry about near as much. You know, uh, the, the, everything would be far more survivable that we deal with in terms of the threats we face in this nation. I mean, economic collapse, you know, you're going to have some problems, but you're probably not going to starve to death. Grid collapse, you're going to starve to death. You know? Yeah. Uh, to me, this, that's, the worst, that's the worst case scenario is the collapse of the grid. I even did a, I actually did a video and I said, uh, grid down is worse than a nuclear war. That was the title of my video. And because I'm trying to get people's attention to how important this is. Now, Dr. Pry thought that what would happen is they, if, they, if they really wanted to take us out, that they would hit, hit us with the MP and the, they hit us with cyber, then mm -hmm. multi-prong attack. And then they would uh, have, send the guys out to do direct kinetic attacks on the power uh substations like we've seen some poor examples of that lately not the real good trained people that know exactly the worst things to hit but oh maybe they do maybe they're not trying to hit those they're just trying to get attention uh yeah you and i wouldn't take more imagination for us to discuss what could happen but you know the uh the thing is that he was concerned that they then might follow up with taking out our strategic weapons uh not, not hitting cities but, but then they could turn around and ransom the cities I mean, a lot of everybody's out there going, well, well, we'll just respond with our nuke submarines. No, you're not. You know, what 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 uh, Jonathan here is explaining to you guys, we get an EMP attack. We're not responding with anything. I mean, our, you know, they, these are super weapons that are uh, built to put out more field intensity than our hardening standard, which he just cited at 85 kilovolts per meter, which is more than the original one a few years ago was 50. 50. Yep. Yeah. So it was 50. It's been up. I knew it was up something. I couldn't remember what it got up to. So 85. Okay. But 85 is far shy, uh, and a lot of stuff was built in the 50, and it's probably not been upgraded. So the 85 is still far shy than 200 kilovolts per meter, 200,000 volts per meter. Let me explain that, you know, in, in layman terms there. Uh, a voltage put on the lines, that's a very significant amount of voltage. Now, I know there's some companies that are selling little chintzy boxes they claim is going to protect your home from 42 hits of that stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying the, the dark part out loud. <laughs> Be very leery of snake oil. Stuff. I literally watched a, I don't even want to say the name of their, um, uh, their, their web page. I, I watched a 15 minute, um, a 15 minute video on the, the guy's name was Paul Giamonti and he's a plumber and, you know, he discovered you know this, and he and he had he laid out the grid down threat and the threats, and I'm like, okay, this this is good. Somebody sent it to me. I don't usually click on this stuff, right? And I'm watching it, and he goes through and he says, you know, and the the power is going to be out. There's going to be suffering, all this other stuff. And he said, so he came up with this solution. His friend works for some eight, or his brother works for some agency. He went to it was this whole rigmarole, and he came up with it was. Uh, some applied something rod. It was some like home built electric, uh, pro electric electricity, um, producing thing that you build in your basement and it powers your entire house. And he has the secret blueprints for him. He's going to sell them to you for $67, you know, for the secret blueprints. But like, he was like, Oh, and he went to church and the power went out one day. He ran home and got it and he took it and he pat and the church power came on. And then the priest came or the pastor came over, put his hand on his shoulder. He said, that's a gift from God. He's like, I just knew I had to spread it to the world. And I'm sitting there like, dude, 
I will knock I will knock the name of my God off your lips if I ever see this dude, right? So, I mean, literally, like, just snake oil salesman to the hilt in this Show industry. me I one. Just, just show uh, me one of these. You hear this all the time. Show me one. Show me one. More. I know. Show me one. Just show me one anywhere, anywhere, anybody. Does somebody just come bring one to me? Let me see it. I am an electrical engineer. I've been an electrical engineer for decades. Right. right. Tons of people were in power to defend. Now, I know people from decades back that claim this stuff too, but I've never seen a one of them have one that works. <laughs> right. I mean, I there's, 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 there's lots of theories. Stuff, you know, but I've never I mean, seen he, one he, that works. He threw out Tesla's name, something to do with like the Tesla stuff. But I mean, the, these concepts have been out there for a long time. And there's a lot of conspiracies that, you know, the, you know, Area 51 come in there and they snatch it up and the people disappear. Okay, fine, whatever. But the point is, yeah, this guy's not going to be out there making 60 bucks, $67 per blueprint, you know, and that could power your whole house for free. And I mean, give me a break. And he was saying, and so he was saying, so the rest of the world's going to burn around you and you're going to be the the light, you know, in the middle of the city. You're going to be the only one with power and your kids will be protected. I'm like, if you're the only one with lights on. Turn them off. They're going to come man. eat you. Now turn those lights off. Yeah, they're they're all coming for you. Exactly. <laughs> Here I am. There's meat right here. We got power. Right. Who's the meat? It's you. Uh, long pork. The two-legged long pork. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I tell people? I tell them, don't be the long pork. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a top prepping advice. Don't be the long yeah. pork. <laughs> there ain't nothing else to eat. It's you. <laughs> So, so yeah, and so this is this is it's a it's a scary thing. I mean, we both know, Greg. This is a very literally worst case scenario. Uh, I'm going to be blunt. Even if you have a, a significant amount of money to put into this, it's going to be difficult to survive. Uh, my philosophy is, I'll give you kind of my three basic philosophies for anybody out there listening that wants to survive a long term grid down EMP collapse. Okay, number one, understand the threat. Educate yourself on what the what it's the world's gonna look like because everybody wants to just run out there and start buying prepping supplies wrap your head around the game game plan in your brain first okay uh there's a lot of historical books on famine that you must read to understand how people are going to work uh red famine by ann applebaum is probably the best uh dark secrets of shtf survival by selko bogovich is another one uh there's Mao's Great Famine is another one. Uh, the, the, there's books on the Holomador, books on uh, the, the the Holocaust, and then the conditions in the Warsaw Ghetto, which could be kind of similar to an early EMP. Read these books and un look at what humans did to humans. And these are deeply religious humans that had tight family connections, that had life skills you don't have, okay, that had a work ethic that most Americans don't have, right? And these people still... We're eating each other, essentially, right? And and the look at what happened. This idea that it's America, we're different, we're past that. You know, we're going to hold hands, sing kumbaya, work together, everything's going to be just fine. That, that's not ever. We'll be the yeah. worst place ever when it goes in because we're the least prepared. Like you said, we're, we don't have the work ethic. We've had it solved. Our people got no mm -hmm. concept for this. All those people came from hard times. They're already in a hard scrabble situation. They knew how to survive that. Uh, hey, one of the things I've done on my channel early on is I put videos up about wild foraging, foraging for wild yes. medicines. I mean, you know, you, you can't carry everything with you. I mean, I, I do advise that people to put up caches wherever they can to, to, to hide stuff, whether it be uh, food, uh, filters, water filters, some little medicinal stuff, and, you know, the, the fire starter, uh, things like that. You need to have some caches, you know, some I, you know, I use code words. I flip words around like nug, if you know what I mean. It's a flip word. But mm -hmm. nugs, honey, you got to feed them kibbles, if you know what I mean. You need to put some That's of that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my nugs get, get get hungry. I have to, hey, I like to ask my people. You got to feed them. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> have you hugged your nug today? <laughs> <laughs> Happiness is a warm nug. <laughs> but anyway, all that aside, uh, yeah, you, you, you got to be able to protect yourself, protect your family. And uh, your caches are important, but, you know, you still can't carry, you can't carry all the water with you. You can't carry, uh, the, you may have to leave home. You may have to go on, on maneuvers. But again, if you don't leave home, they may ransack your house. Then anything in it's gone. So the only thing you might have is something you might have buried somewhere else. That's why you want stuff that you can bury as much as possible. But then again, I say that, that uh, 
when you go on these maneuvers, you, you're just going to have to be living quietly, maneuvering quietly and, and, and be unseen if it comes down to that. But if it don't, uh, having, well, the skills, having the skills to know how to acquire what's already out there, knowing how to eat from the land will be crucial. Well, I think that's also it's that's going to be very difficult too because you're going to have 330 other 330 million other Americans stripping the land bare uh, of every tree, every every deer. You're not going to see a oh, brown living deer. creature. Oh, they won't be. No yeah, I, I, you're going to be eating cattails and 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 pine cone soup. Uh, so my philosophy kind of is you. Uh, you know, I would really caution you. The life skills are really important. You need to learn that stuff. But the I would highly caution anybody with, and I know you're not advocating this, but like the open road mindset where you're going to live off the national forest, live off the open road, have a location to go to. So in my book, Survival Theory, I, I lay out the threats, what you need to understand. So that was the first thing, understand what's coming. The second thing is kind of have a plan to, to, to deal with the worst case scenario, not the best. So kind of modern prepper and I, I, you know, philosophy is, is we'll start easy, start prepping for a tornado, work your way up so to a hurricane, you know, and slowly build your, your stuff up. My philosophy is, is you're never going to get enough supplies to where you're prepared for an EMP, right? So wrap your brain, come up with a game plan for the, the hard thing. You may not be able to afford everything, but that's where your mind is focused, right? And mm -hmm. then any of these other minor scenarios, walking apart, right? Yeah, yeah. Gra gravy, right? So the do that, and so like like if if you don't, most people probably have an uncle somewhere, a, a third cousin that has a farm somewhere or lives rurally. I put seven different options for people on a complete budget on how to get out of a city uh, and have a plan ahead of time to go somewhere where you're not dependent on you know the, the kind of again the, the mindset is you know. Stay in your home. It's your place of safety. It's your safe environment. Uh, you have, you know, food in your cupboards. Well, that's going to run out, you know, and then everybody says, stay there until it gets so bad that you're forced to leave. In my opinion, if you wait three weeks in, you've ran out of food. Neighbors are killing gunshots all day and night long in your town. Okay. People killing each other over the last can of peaches. That's the last time. That's the last time you want to be on the open road, traveling to your 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 cousin Bob's farm. You need to get there early, right? And, and and avoid the death and destruction that's coming two weeks, three weeks down the road. You know, and in some cases one week, depending on where you live. But oh, there'll be uh, war, so, there'll be warlords that that'll have choke points on the road. You won't get past them. They'll, 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 yeah, they'll shake everybody down. So you, I say you got I, you got three days. You got three days to get out of the city. You got four or five days to get, you know, in the open road to kind of get to where you need to go. Uh, but if you're still on the open road, you know, and the, the country we talk about, the country's going to fall apart a little slower, but yet you are absolutely right. You read Selko Bogovic's book. Um, it, it will turn into warlords. It, you know, people are going to run out of food. They're going to start banding together. They're going to start raiding each other. Groups are going to fight groups. They're going to absorb groups. They're going to defeat groups. And eventually, you're going to end up with the biggest, baddest dude with the biggest, baddest gun who's willing to check his check his morality at the door and do the worst possible things. That dude's going to be leading the groups. Uh, you know, I think it was Dr. Baker that said, uh, it might have been Dr. Graham, I don't know. One of the EMP commissioners, you know, was said that, you know, it's Continental Time Machine and, uh, you know, it killed 90% of the population, but you don't want to be around the other 10%, right? You know, so. Yeah, those yeah. will be some bad hombres. <laughs> there will be some bad hombres. They're going to be tough. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's stuff that people need to be aware of. We're also trying to form survival tribes in our, uh, a lot of my prepper followers. We've got uh, a network. You need a group. Yep. Survival Don't tribe I network dot org. So, yeah, good. Com, survival tribe network dot com. I'll put links to this. And I'll put I'll put links to the EMP uh, commission or task force and send me links to your books and, and, and your links in the email. And I'll put them on this video. Great. When I post it. Uh, and when we get done, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, a conversation I've had with a state rep, uh, state senator here that might might be relevant. We need to think about in our commission. So I'm going to OK, food for thought. go for it. So, uh, and we'll talk about that offline. So we've been oh, okay. here for about almost an hour. But the key things, guys, is 
to get ready, to be prepared. Like I said, you need to wrap your mind around what's coming. You need to be mentally, physically, and spiritually prepared as much as anything else for what's going to come. It's, it's uh, the mental side of it, the mental fortitude is going to probably be more important than anything you put in the cupboard. So, uh, yeah, you can pack your cupboards up, and you should when you can. Uh, oh, one other little tip I might give. If you can get out to that farm, get out to that place, the thing is that farmer's going to be in the same situation you are in a part because he's going to have all these tractors and equipment to farm, you know, 100 acres of land, 40 acres of land, and then that stuff working. Ain't none of it going to work. He's going to need people who can farm and grow stuff to manually work the land like the old days. Exactly. They're going to need yep. labor on the farms like they needed a long time ago. If you know how to garden, if you know how to farm and you can get yourself to, to a place like that, that, that individual uh, who can't use their equipment anymore will be willing once they realize that their land, just they can't do nothing with it. And you know, all the seeds they bought from Montesano or whoever, Bayer, whoever it is now, aren't going to be available anymore. They're going to be willing to, to cut deals. So buy seeds now. Buy seeds. Have seeds available. Get you some gardening tools. And when you go, have something to offer. Hey, don't go in and say, hey, I'm going to move in on you. No, they don't want that. But if you come in and say, hey, I got a deal for you. I can. I got seeds. I got tools. If you just let me uh, work this uh, corner of the land, you get half of what I grow. Sharecropping. And they're going to go, hey, I can't do nothing else with that anyway. And I got an ally here. We can we can have each other's back in the tough times, you know. Hey, bingo, you got it. Hey, Greg, it's so funny because I think <laughs> how did you get an advanced copy of my book? Because I don't think I how did you get it? That's one of my strategies. So one of my strategies is even if you don't have an Uncle Bob, okay, uh, align yourself with a a a a rural farmer. Look, reverse engineer the Google Earth. Find a farm that's on a dead end road somewhere. You're probably gonna get ten doors slammed in your face. And this isn't an easy thing. I'm not saying this is a simple solution. But if you don't also have two million dollars to hire me to build your survival retreat either, you know, you you have to do what you have to do. Find a farmer. Get to know them beforehand, so you're not a stranger showing up on their door. Offer to help them buck bales in this, you know, in the summer. To, to, hey, uh, I'd like to learn about farming, you know, on the weekends. Can I just come out free? Let me just help you. I'd like to to learn more about farming. Most farmers, their kids have grown up and moved to the city. You take some young guy with strong muscles, come and say, "Hey, I'd like to learn about farming." They're gonna be like, "Come on in, boy." You know, let me show you how to drive a tractor. And they'll have you on that thing in 10 minutes, right? So get to know a farmer like that. Um, I actually know, I have recommended this to, 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 you know, clients that were on the lower end of the spectrum that couldn't afford things. I actually know people that have done this. I have a client that made friends and they parked their RV on the back corner of a farmer's property. And they go there and they help them. They they share a garden. They garden together. And then what do you do? Desperate for labor. They yeah, what's that? Hire people, and if you do, they'll steal everything you got. And, and exactly. Work. So what I tell people is, instead of keeping all your survival food, your supplies, and a lot of your extra ammunition in home, find the storage unit closest to that farmer's house. Okay, that farmer's location. Keep it in a storage unit near his, the closest one to his house. Then when you show up, so I'm also not saying to show up to your local farmer and say, "Hey, I'm a prepper. The end of the world's coming. I'm here to save you." You know, he's gonna think you're nuts. Just offer to help him. Just don't talk prepping. Don't talk survival. But, but you build a relationship with him. And then after the event happens, when you show up at his front door, he knows your face and be like, hey, by the way, this is what's happening in the world. And I got extra seed. I got food. I got extra, you know, gardening supplies, whatever else. And I'll share. We'll work together. And like you said, they're going to need you. They're gonna, their tractors are going to be out of fuel soon, or even if they're still working. So... Yeah, I mean, that's, well, that's one of the strategies I lay out in my book in detail. So there you go. Well, I see, I've already went through this thought exercise. You know, I, you know, I, <laughs> basically, I got my own little farm here, and I know what it's like to try to do that. But I'm, I'm in a kind of an urban setting almost, so it's not the best place. But yeah, I know exactly what that is. I grew up on a farm, so well, right, people here are talking, and they say, you know, end of the. This is so far above my. I can't do anything, right? So it's like kind of the, the ostrich thing. Like if I if I can't wrap my head or my hands around this scenario, I'm just gonna put my head in the sand and pretend this doesn't happen, or I'm just gonna figure it out when the time comes. My again, my strategy, you know, my I put five, six, seven different strategies in here 
for you to, to consider different ones, maybe combine a couple of them. They're going to take some legwork ahead of time. But, you, you know, if you can't afford a survival retreat, you know, 3,000 acres and the bunkers and the stuff that I do on the side here, you know, do do at least have a plan for your family. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be thinking back to this conversation that me and Greg are having right now, two months into this event. And you're going to be sitting there thinking, man, I wish I would have followed that advice. So, I don't yep. know what better advice we can any prepping channels ever gave anyone than what we just said right here, right now. And and, and so for those few of you that listen to the end, you got a bonus. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> the best prepping advice, period, out there, bar none. So anyway, John, I really appreciate you. You're 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 awesome. You you know what you're doing. You've been part of that serve team. You know, uh, you have definitely a SEER team. Uh, you have walked the walk, talked the talk. You're out there consulting the rich people how to survive, but you're you're seeing what it's going to take for everybody else. You are going above and beyond because uh, I know darn well that you know all of us in this EMP task force, we don't get no money for this. We're doing this out of nope. a lot of people don't That's realize right. that we do this out of our own time, out of our own pockets. When you, you're talking about all these trips you were taking, I know you paid for those. Did get yep, oh. didn't did get dime. Yep. Uh, you know, I've done this kind of stuff with, with, with power grid defense. I chaired two power grid defense conferences and lost a lot of money on the last one, actually. And, you know, I've been, when I was in the National Space Society, when I was uh, 10 years, the director of the policy committee, that's how I learned a lot about the workings of Congress and what really works. And, uh, you know, for, for over 20 years, I was supporting that stuff. I did all that out of my own pocket. A lot of people don't understand that people, the people that push society along uh, are the people that are really out here on their own dime doing it. Uh, yeah, there's the big corporations. There's the people that get some pay to do di different things. But the people that are really pushing to make a difference, that are fighting for what we citizens need, or we're operating on our own. And I know you're operating on our own. So it's people like you, people like Command Sergeant Major Mike, maybe, people like uh, our late uh, friend, uh, Dr. Pry, who are my real heroes. So uh, stay, you know, keep up the good work. I really appreciate you. And guys, check out the links below. It, some people don't understand. Just check the show notes or the pin note that will be in the comment section and you will find these things and, and more. I'll put a lot of content in there for you guys to look at. So, John, I really appreciate you, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for having me on, man. I, I really enjoyed being with you here today. All right, we got to do this. We got to do this more often. It's been a while. We've been on a couple. Yeah. It's been a while. And uh, everyone. Just to check the links, please do that. And I'm going to stay on board with him for just a minute more. So to everyone else, I'm going to say thank you for watching. And Greg out.